welcome to episode three of the podcast Path to the Priesthood, the interview session where we sit down with priests and deacons from around the country, and we ask them about their stories that led them to ordained ministry in Christ's church. I'll be your host, Christo Papadimus. Today we have a very special guest for you all. We uh, have not one of only my best friends from the seminary, but my Kumbaro, uh, a man who asked me to baptize his oldest son, Jake. We have for you today, Father Patrick O'Rourke. And before we turn things over to Father Patrick, let's hear a little bit about his background. Father Patrick was born on January 15th, 1986 to Dennis and Susan O'Rourke in Toledo, Ohio. After graduating from Whitmer High School, Father Patrick enrolled at The Ohio State University, where he studied art and journalism. In the summer before his final year at Ohio State, Father Patrick discovered the Orthodox Christian faith and was chrismated into the church on August 24, 2008. He graduated from The Ohio State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism in May 2009. Father Patrick is married to Jessica Tyndall of Austin, Texas. They were joined in holy matrimony at Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Austin, Texas by His Eminence Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit on June 7, 2014. Father Patrick was ordained to the Holy Diaconate on Palm Sunday, April 24, 2016 by His Eminence Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit at Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Toledo, Ohio. He graduated magna cum laude from Holy Cross later that spring. He was ordained to the Holy Priesthood by His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius Gerund of America at Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in New Rochelle, New York on September 18th, 2016, where he served as assistant priest until July 31st, 2018. He then served as priest dominus at Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Ogden, Utah until August 31st, 2020. He was assigned to the Greek Orthodox Church of Greater Salt Lake, serving as assistant priest beginning September 1st, 2020. Father Patrick and Presbytera Jessica are, are, are parents to their sons, Jacob and Lucas. Father Patrick celebrates his name day March 17th on the, on the Feast of St. Patrick of Ireland. Welcome, Father Patrick. Thank you so much, Christo, for having me. I'm really excited. We're, we're happy to have you. Now, you and I are good friends, as we know, obviously, um, but there is so much to the story that brought you to the priesthood. And I know a lot of people are excited to hear about what brought you all the way from the Ohio State University to Hellenic College Holy Cross. So I'd like to turn it over to you now for you to share your story with us. You can begin as far back as you would like to in high school. You can uh, begin whenever your journey into Orthodoxy started. Um, essentially, what we would like to know is, when you first thought of becoming a priest. Father Patrick, take it away. Thanks, Kubato. Uh, it's, uh, let me just reiterate, it's a joy to be here with you and to yeah. share a bit of our uh, relationship with everybody else. Yeah. Um, and I also thank you for saying university every time you said the. That's the rule, ladies and gentlemen. If you're gonna I didn't even know the, that, look at that. <laughs> if you're gonna say the Ohio State University, or if you're gonna say the in front, you have to say university at the end. It's not the Ohio State. That's the state of Ohio. So. Awesome. Pedantry aside, uh, which is features pretty strongly in my story. Um, the, the story of how I became a priest, um, I guess, well, we will start with my upbringing. Yeah. Um, parents raised my sister and I in a local, uh, sort of independent Pentecostal church. Okay. Uh, the border between just charismatic and Pentecostal was pretty fluid. And um, I, I think though I, I'm safe to say that it was pretty Pentecostal. Um, I remember being about nine or 10 years old when uh, I spoke in tongues for the first oh, time. See, I didn't, okay. You did the speaking in tongues, okay. I did it. Because everybody else in the room was doing that that Sunday, <laughs> so I did it too. And while I'm not saying that everybody who experiences something like that is a fraud, I was. Yes. Um, I made that up to fit in with everybody else, and it became the biggest deal of the whole day. Like The pastor came down from the stage. They made a big circle around me. I was super embarrassed. Whoa. And I remember thinking, wow, I just... 
I just made that up. And that seeded a, a little bit of doubt deep, deep, deep inside of my spiritual heart. And it stayed there all through high school. Um, in high school, I, I chose to go to a different church. My family had sort of fallen away um, from regular attendance. Sure. I started going to um, another church and uh, it was it was a couple towns over. Nobody knew me there. Um, I was in with the youth group there and um, were you going on your taking, own at this point? Pretty much. Yeah, I was driving. Wow. by, So I would go to so church again, in high school. Like a, 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 your personal journey began. You kind of it was already you had the family church experience, but already by high school, you're kind of on a personal road. Interesting. That's right. Um, and I remember not being very satisfied with that experience. Um, I couldn't explain why, though. I just it, there was something missing. And what I chose to to mark it up as was by the time I left for college that, you know, religion is kind of make believe. Uh, yeah. Sure. Which a lot of kids going into college feel that way. And especially in college is when this idea can kind of take off and become a complete uh, disregard of religion during the college experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember my freshman uh, philosophy course at the Ohio State University. <laughs> um, I still remember the professor's name because it had such an effect on me. Um, I won't share it because I don't want to sure. shame anybody. Sure. But loved to pick on the Christians in class. Oh. Uh, and so I remember one time trying to argue back and he obliterated me. Whoa. I, I was not prepared for that level of discourse. I was not trained enough. I didn't know the Christian faith. Well, sure, freshman in college too, going against the professor, the deck is kind of stacked again. He probably, you know, he, he probably was hoping to have an interaction like this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was, I was right there. I was like, "Ooh, pick me, pick me. I'll, I'll, I'll be the <laughs> yeah. mid-American Christian kid. Yeah. Um, and by the time I was in my last year at Ohio State, uh, I was actively not a Christian. Yes. Uh, so, and let, let me qualify that in a little bit when we get there. Um, yeah. I joined a fraternity very quickly. Uh, my first Ohio State was still on quarters at the time. They're now on semesters like the rest of the civilized oh, world. Oh, look at that. Yeah. But we were on quarters. Um, and so my first quarter at Ohio State, I I was away. I was a free man at school. And yeah. so I would bounce from frat party to frat party and ended up. You were Sigma Chi or is that in or SAE? What were you? Take it back. First time. Sigma Chi. Okay. Sigma Chi. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, and I joined, I joined the fraternity and that became my existence. That became my, my complete identity. As it does for a lot of college kids. Sure. Yeah. And it was really, it was really helpful because at Ohio state, it's huge. Yeah. Uh, when I was there, there were 60 some thousand undergrads, um, wow. which is in most cities in America. So yeah, like, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, and it, it shrunk my world. It, it gave me a, an in-group. It gave me a larger, you know, broader, fraternity world that I, I navigated and yeah but here's here's the thing my raising um led me to be very insecure about who I am and what I believe what I like and what I want to do and I think and I'm, I'm pretty sure that I joined a fraternity because of who I thought I wanted to be sure and one of the side effects of of that uh of who I was at the time or who I wasn't um, was that I was a pathological liar. Huh. I, I would make versions of myself carefully tailored to everybody I met. Uh, so you would kind of depend not like for lack of a better term, like a chameleon, right? Anyone you met, you would kind of like adopt to their, oh yeah, I'm like this, I'm like that. Is that, I, how would you define pathological liar? I didn't know who I was, so I didn't, I couldn't present myself to you. Um, I, I would regularly tell tall tales, uh, everything from like embellishing an actual story to make it a little bit more interesting at a party sure. to blatant, unbelievable lies. Got it. Okay. For example, you and I are gym rats. Um, yes. 
I once told people I could, I maxed my bench press at 350 pounds. Wait, wait, wait. As a, like a freshman in college, you were benching 350 pounds? Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's the first, that's like the easiest lie is like, how much do you bench? And that's the first, yeah, that's, uh, okay, so got it. You were, then, you were that guy. Then I defended it. I doubled down. Well, yeah, you can't, at that point, you can't, you can't go back. And, yeah. Yeah. So anyways, that gives you a picture of sort of who I was at the time. I got gotcha. you. Uh, yeah. At Ohio State, I changed my major six times. Further, okay. further indication that I had no idea who I was yeah. or what I do and you know i'm not saying to the audience don't change your major um or even that your major really matters because i don't know if it does um good point but uh i was bouncing all over the place and um by the time we get to my fourth year i won't call it my senior year because i had to come back okay uh, for an extra lap because of all those changes i uh i was not no longer a praying person um I called myself a Christian, so there's the qualification. Oh, so you did, you did call yourself a Christian going through all this, the, the fraternity life, um, different bouncing around from majors. You did, you hung on to some form of um, your Christian identity. Yeah, but it was, it was super. Uh, Superficial. It was, I, I'm a white German and Irish American from Ohio. Yeah. Like, I'm a Christian. Um, I drive on the right side of the road. I drink Budweiser. Like, yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a Midwestern boy. You're and from so, uh, the, the birthplace of the Willis Jeep, I believe, right? Is that true? Or is it Jeep in general? I grew up off of Willie's Parkway. Um, right. from, from my backyard, you could see the original Jeep plant that was built to uh, chuck those things out into World War II. That the, is field, the, the field that I grew up playing in and like finding garter snakes and worms and golf balls in was the original test track for the first Jeeps. Wow. So literally yeah. the heartland of America. This is you were born and bred. And so this was your this was your identity, so to speak, at Ohio State, right? Definitely. So I, I called myself a Christian, but I did not behave like a Christian and I didn't think like a Christian. And a lot of that is because I didn't know what a Christian was. Sure. Um, and. You know, at a certain point, I said things to people like, you know, God is the Easter Bunny for grownups and Mm. All these kinds of things uh, came out of my mouth. And uh, then as I'm approaching the end of my fourth year, um, I am not a praying person, but I'm sending vibes into the universe, you know? Like, I, there is, I, I'm, I'm trying my best to not pray, but I'm also, like, begging for a sign. Oh, Show me the I see. To go. Um, and I wasn't conscious of doing that at the time um i was going through a super bad bout of insomnia i was working at a moving company um my whole summer was just pick things up and put them down yeah um, with you know with all of the the dirt and the grime that goes into you know you've moved a couch before imagine that that's all that you do I and truly, I truly cannot imagine <laughs> it. Being gym rats, everyone assumes we like lifting heavy things. Uh, that is inaccurate. I actually, moving is one of my least favorite activities. And to, to imagine doing that all day, every day while having insomnia, while on this um, crazy journey, it sounds like an exhausting, uh, an exhausting life for, for a young, for a young man, uh, 20 years old, however you were back then. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. I, so the average American, I think some, it's something like they move like six or eight times in their life as mm -hmm. adult. I've done more than 2,000 moves. Whoa, um, so you did that job for a while. Yeah, I started Long the, enough, summer, yeah. the summer after I went away to college, or the summer that I went before, the summer before I went away to college. Anyways, lots of work history. We don't need to go into it, sure. but um, the what was going on then was that I, um, I was just up all night and angry. Mm. I could tell that I wasn't going to sleep, so I'd work myself up and I'd get upset about it. Um, and I remembered that one of my fraternity brothers had been watching this HBO miniseries called Rome and okay. I'm a history nerd. So yeah. I thought, you know what, do you, can I borrow those DVDs? Yes, kids. That's how old I am. Um, and I said, let me, let me borrow that box set of DVDs. <laughs> do you have the HD or yeah. <laughs> oh, it, do they, I think they were actually Blu-ray. Was it so Blu-ray? It was Blu-ray. Okay. I'm not that old, but uh, 
36. Uh, so I grab, I grab these DVDs and when I can't sleep, I'm watching an HBO show about sex and sandals. Yeah. Um, and then like, I'm checking their history because I'm a history nerd. So I want to see, you know, d- did those things happen? Were those people Doing. really live at the same time? Did, uh, did that battle happen, et cetera? And they did, I mean, by all uh, my amateur research, they did a really good job of presenting the world of ancient Rome. Okay. And then one of these nights during a bout of insomnia, as I'm reading about um, Augustus, the first emperor, who's one of the main characters of the series. Um, on Wikipedia, you can, over in the sidebar, let's see if you're looking, it's on this side. Mm-hmm. Um, on the sidebar, you can see like who the emperor was, who came before him and who came after right. him. And so I'm just like reading these bio pages on Wikipedia about every emperor, trying to Did bore you know? myself. Um, and I get to Constantine. Ah. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> there it is. And we know um, that one, yeah. <laughs> and not not just well. Remember, I don't know anything about right, right. at this point yeah. Christian history. I don't know anything. The church that I was raised in was founded in 1982. Oh, uh, look at that! Yeah. So I don't know anything about tradition or anything like that before 1982. Wow. Uh, and uh, here's an extra fold. Every fraternity has a ritual um, and a myth and secret passwords and in fact the letters that are on the front of the house like i'm a sigma chi Mm -hmm. those are the first initials of the secret password um Mm -hmm. so all the fraternities like beta theta pi there it's a three-word password and it starts with a beta oh i see vita yeah uh, (laughs) beta thetas yeah beta theta pi one of my class or one of my pledge brothers in the fraternity um it was born and raised greek american oh okay he would tear into us every time we try to say it. Like, it's Vita, okay? Vita. It's not hard to say. Vita. Um, power to him because that is a losing battle. Those, uh, those, like, those pronunciations yeah. are like ingrained in all those people. So power to him for, for trying to keep it yeah. real. Exactly. So uh, Vasily, if you're watching this, howdy. I'm a priest now. Um, Crazy. That, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so... Sigma Chi's uh, story, their myth, is all wrapped around Constantine. Look at um, that. Yeah. So I perked up at like two in the morning while I'm reading this bio on Wikipedia. And I was like, oh, I know this one. I know this one. Oh, okay. And I read with great attention uh, the Wikipedia page about Constantine. Um, I read about how he moved the capital of the Roman world from Rome to a city he called New Rome. And everybody after him called it the city of Constantine, Constantinople. Yeah. Um, and how he removed the pagan temples that were in that place because he is the first Christian emperor. And he wants to refound the empire as a Christian nation. And so he builds churches over the sites of those previous pagan temples. And then the little blue link next to it said Eastern Orthodox. I had no idea what that was. Sure. I had a- Pledge brother who was Greek American and Greek Orthodox. I grew up with a kid in Toledo, Ohio, who was Cretan, like oh. his parents off the boat. And oh, that's why you love Cretes. So we'll get into that later. But that okay, okay. Until that day, that's where it began. Childhood friend worshipped the Olympian gods. I was that guy. <laughs> well, yeah. What, how, yeah. What else, how would you know otherwise? Until you're right. googling Saint Constantine, which is exactly. amazing. If I don't know if they have his life story on Wikipedia, I'm sure they do, but. I remember reading his life story in a class at the seminary and it reads like like a gladiator type movie it's it's like how no one has tapped into that in in hollywood yet is beyond me seriously but yeah but and anyway. and the the crazy thing about constantine and this is off topic but yes you can edit you can well i guess we're live so you can't edit it out so you're stuck with it um <laughs> he he has of all the roman emperors there is more um there is more documentation about who he was and what he did and where he went than any other Roman emperor. Look at uh, that. By orders of magnitude, it's something like three times the documents. Don't quote me, I'm not a scholar. But like uh, more than Julius Caesar, more than, more than the most like recognized, that's amazing. Exactly, exactly. Um, so anyways, so I read about Constantine, I read about these churches and I left that little blue link 
unclicked. It never turned purple. Never purple, yeah. <laughs> and um, I fell asleep. I had bored myself to sleep. I was finally, okay. and I go back to my day in and day out working at the moving company, heading into my fifth year at Ohio State. It's the summer of 2008. And um, my dad, my Pentecostal dad calls me one day and says, you know what, Scott? Because that's my first name, my given first name, Scott. Um, he's like, you need to get back into the church and read the Bible and say your prayers to his 22-year-old frat boy son who oh. uh, says things in class like the Easter Bunny is for grown-ups, or that God is the Easter Bunny for grown-ups. Right. So um, I hung up on him. Wow. Yeah, I hung up on my dad. Yeah, you can't tell me, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I go back to my to my place that night and just forget about it ever happening. I have to go to bed. Hopefully I can sleep because the next day I have to go back and pick things up and put them down. Yeah. And the next day on the drive home from work, I'm at the same red light where my dad called. And I remembered what he said to me. And as I'm waiting for the red light, I look over into the uh, shopping center and there's a Christian bookstore. And huh. so I was like, you know what? I don't even know if I own a Bible. And maybe as a, as a research tool, yeah, it's sure. Sure. a good thing for me to have. Yeah. So I pull in and I don't grab a Bible. In fact, what I found there on the end cap of the first shelf was called a book called Light from the Christian East. Um, which was an, and then the subtitle was an introduction to Orthodox Christianity huh. from an American Protestant perspective. Uh, it might have been like Eastern that. Orthodox Christianity, something like that. Sure. And so I was like, oh wait, like Constantine, I read this, I, I know about this. Oh. I don't know about this. So I picked that book up, and uh, the the little sweet lady that was uh, that was checking me out at the counter, um, she was like. Oh, this this is the first time anybody's bought this one. Are you clergy? Huh. Now, mind you, I'm wearing my uniform from my moving company. I'm covered in sweat and dust. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, no. No, I'm, I'm not. Uh, and I took that book home and I couldn't put it down. I fell asleep with it in my lap, in my office chair, at my desk. Which is burning office. through it, reading it already, you mean? Yeah. Wow. And I finished it the next day. Wow. And I decided, you know what? this is insane. This is a whole different kind of Christianity than I've ever been exposed to. Yeah. So I was raised Pentecostal, but with a name like O'Rourke, you would be right to assume that the rest of my family is Catholic. Yes. Um, so I had been to like first communions and weddings and funerals. And okay. I, my childhood best friend is Catholic and I, I would go to uh, midnight mass with him on Christmas and stuff like that. So I was exposed to some tradition as a kid. Um, but not this. Mm -hmm. And what really struck me was that it wasn't just, it wasn't just answering the same questions in a slightly nuanced, different way. It wasn't the Protestant versus Catholic fighting. Right. There were fundamentally different questions. Right. Um, the, the whole point was fundamentally different. And it was really intriguing. And I'd never heard of anything like this. And um, so I went to Barnes and Noble. And I was uh -huh. like, hey, do you have any books on uh, Eastern Orthodoxy? And the guy was like, we have this book of icons. Do you want it? And I was like, oh, that's, that's not what I meant. Which is ironic uh, because we'll get into that later when we talk about your interests and your hobbies, but that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that, that one features pretty big. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I get to uh, I, I, I get to flabbergast this guy. And he's like, oh, uh, not, the, not the icons book. Hold on. <laughs> And he gets over the loudspeaker with his little, you know, retail mic. mic. Yeah. Isaac, Isaac to the information desk, please. Isaac. And out from the stock room comes a man with hair to his shoulders and a full beard. Whoa. And yeah. And, and, his, I, and his name was Isaac? Yeah. Okay. And so, so I was like, like you could hear like the, the sappy Middle Eastern music that you see on like History Channel documentaries about, about like the early Christians and stuff like that. Like yeah, I heard that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, he walks up and he's quiet and calm and he's got this weird bracelet with a bunch of knots on it. And oh. uh, Isaac converted by himself when he was 12. 
And by the time he was out of high school, he had brought the rest of his family into the Orthodox faith. And he happened to be working at, at this Barnes and Noble, which there must be thousands of Barnes and Nobles in the country. Where would you find um, like a resident Orthodox employee at Barnes? That's, that's right? there's already, there's a lot of things. Yeah, wow, that's okay. For somebody so what, who had never, ever encountered Orthodox Christianity in 22 years of life, um, to now walk into Barnes and Noble and here comes one, I was yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here, here comes one. And, it's not, you know, his name is not Demosthenes or something like that. Like, right. His name is Isaac. He's a white dude like me. Yeah. Uh, and by the time Isaac was out of high school, he brought his whole family in. And so he's read all the books. And I Look think, I don't know this for absolute certain, but I think he's a monk in a monastery here in America someplace now. Look at that. The last time I was in Columbus, I was asking about him and somebody said that they thought he's a monk someplace. So Perhaps working in the library at a monastery now, maybe he's right? gone, moved on up for so, the nobles. So my second shout out, Isaac, if you're out there, I would love to recap. And just calling him out left and right. Yeah. We got Vasily and Isaac. Yeah. So Isaac, uh, Isaac was like, yeah, man, we can order you a bunch of books, but there are people that study all these books. They've read them all. They mm -hmm. don't believe anything inside of them because they've never come to meet the church, oh. the church living organism. That's 2000 years old. You need to come and see it. Um, says Isaac. Who could have just easily sold you a book, which is all his job is, but that's amazing. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, in a pretty liberal college town, he's yeah. working at Barnes and Noble and he's like, yeah, you should come to church with me, man. Not just, okay, here's your books. Yeah. Um, now, backstory. I, live in, I lived in Toledo. I was raised in Toledo. Columbus is in the center of the state. The, right at the break of the highway where I'm about to be home, I'm like 10 minutes from home, was one of the largest mosques in America, in Perrysburg. Oh. Okay. So the domed Byzantine Basilica in downtown Columbus, Ohio, looked a lot like a mosque. And to a kid that was raised in a church that used to be the back half of a grocery store, I was uh, not interested in going into that creepy looking church. Yeah. Um, so I said, no, how about, how about we just get the books? Okay. Um, Cause okay. I'm still also to keep a distance from this and I'm not actually serious about this. Right, you literally were just on Wikipedia like the night before, you just, you know, you're kind of, it's even amazing that you've made it to Barnes and Noble at this point after, right, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's like, okay, fine, that's okay. And he orders the books. Um, I get a, an email a couple of weeks later, maybe it was like a week and a half, mm -hmm. that, I, that my books had come in because this is before Amazon, like the books don't ship Oh, yeah, you, you gotta go back to the store. A big deal. Yeah, you had to get in your car and drive back to the store to pick up your books. Yeah. And I get up to the front counter. I'm like, yeah, I have a pickup order for O'Rourke. And the guy goes, the guy was like, oh, yeah. And it's a different guy. It's not Isaac. And he okay. Was like, oh, yeah. And he bends over and he grabs the bag. And he, he was, as, he, as he's bending over, his cross falls out of his shirt. Huh. And it, it's a three bar Russian cross. Oh. Russian Orthodox cross. And so now the hair is starting to stand up on the back of my neck. And I'm like, this Two is good. and one Barnes and Noble? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and as he slid those books across the counter to me, he said, these books are going to change your life. Wow. And I was like, okay, weirdo. See ya. Think yeah. Good. Um, and I took them back and they sat on my desk for a couple of days, maybe a week. And then I had a big, long move from Columbus, Ohio to Manhattan and it's work. So I'm going to, I'm about to go spend four and a half, almost five days with somebody I didn't choose to spend that time with Whoa. Um, in a truck in All traffic. Day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I bring my books and I decide to start reading them. And by the time we're back in Ohio, I've read all of them. And I say, you know what? I need to go. I need to go to that church. Cool. And so I go online and I look up Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral, Columbus, Ohio. I find the website. There's two services listed on a Sunday. So I was like, uh, the, the early one? Oh, wow. I was going to assume the later one for, wow, your early bird. Okay, the early no, one. No, so by, by this point, I'm so, like, the fires are burning. And I'm like. Oh, so you're just ready to get there and see what There is something about. going on here. There's a lot more to this than, than I know about. And. I'm going to push my chips in and I say, you know what, I'm going to show up. So I show up to this first service called Orthros and it is me. I was going to say. And a 75 year old chanter and a priest for an hour. 
dude, that, yeah. But that's not the important thing that happened. I walked into that creepy church that the dome spooked me from the outside. Sure. Looked up inside and I saw a golden mosaic of Christ enthroned, surrounded by 24 uh, of his forebears. Now, this is, um, this is a beautiful church. This is the cathedral in Columbus. That's right. It, it that's is a beautiful church. I, I've seen pictures in it. That's interesting. Your first experience, this goes into the importance on, on the beauty of our churches. And so uh, it worked for, I guess we, sh we can say. It so, worked. Yeah. yeah. So keep, keep so, going. On. So you're an orthos, just the three of you. And I can't stop staring up at the ceiling. Yeah. Um, and by this point, like, I had to memorize the Greek alphabet and be able to say it before match burnt my fingers. Uh, <laughs> So I, I'm trying. trying to sound out the names that I see up there. Oh, sure. Like Adam and David. And it's, it's the Old Testament yeah. lineage of Christ. You can, you can get those ones. That, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I was like, wow. These people don't just preserve their faith. They build it into their church. Because remember... The church I was raised in was the back half of an old grocery store. Mm. There was one cross on the wall. And I think even that was sort of scandalous to some of the people. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, very anti-conic. Okay. And I had been to enough Catholic masses that I sort of, like, once we got into the liturgy portion, I was like, oh, they're going to read the book. Oh, okay. okay. They read sure. I was not prepared for a parade in the middle of it. I was like, oh, oh, they're, oh, we're turning. Oh, we're turning. Yeah. Something's happening. Something's happening. But yeah, yeah. It's a U-turn? He just he just came out from there. I don't get it. Whatever. Yeah, sure. So at about 10.30 that morning, um, maybe 10.45, close to 11, uh, I get tapped on my shoulder. And uh, I hear my first name. Somebody says, Scott. And at this point, I was like, here I am, Lord. <laughs> yes. And it was a guy that I knew from the fraternity who was it, was it, go was ahead. it the guy was it the guy that correcting everyone about the alphabet or was this a different guy? Different guy. Oh different different, guy. you had two in the okay. Yeah, so this guy was in the fraternity a while back. I won't I won't age him. Oh, uh, so he was he preceded but you. But he would he would come around sometimes like on a Friday night and drop off. How do I say this on a church blog? Um Weekend supplies. Okay, yes. Weekend yeah. supplies is, is better. Weekend supplies. Frat sodas. Uh, and so I knew, I knew this guy. I knew who he was. You know, we, we'd gone and like tailgated together. Um, and his name is George Zagernis. He's a, he's a dentist in Columbus. Cool. And um, I was blown away to run it. And so now this is like the third or fourth point of contact of an Orthodox Christian in the in the short span of just a couple of weeks. And this is a known one. This is a person you had a completely different connection with, tailgating football right. games, Ohio State, Sigma Chi, different worlds. So now you have a coming together of these two worlds. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And he leans forward and he's like, dude, are you Greek? <laughs> and no, I'm not Greek. Are you Orthodox? Okay. No. Um, and he was like, okay. Cool. Uh, and we start talking afterwards and um, I see that the priests are like handing out bread or something. So I'm like, I'm, I, I gotta go talk to that guy. Um, and I, I hustle over to the junior priest, Father Joseph de Stefano, okay. uh, who is in the metropolis of Pittsburgh. And he, cause he was far less intimidating than the priest Domino. Um, sure. Is it, it was a, the typical young assistant priest and like an older, more exactly. like veteran looking. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And now our, our school mate, Father Christopher Zafaris is in that role in that church. Oh, is he, is he the Voitho or the assistant yeah. priest? Oh, that's cool. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. So is I went it, up to is, the is it the same priest Dominos or is it? No. Okay. No, no, no. Sure. It's been a long time now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a bit. Um, so I go up to that junior priest and I was like, hey, we need to talk. There's some stuff happening. Um, and I briefly give him a rundown and he goes, hold on a second, sit in that pew, wait for me to keep passing out the bread and we'll walk and talk. Awesome. And he, walk, he walks me into the parish bookstore, more books. <laughs> and he hands me a bag of books and he's like, start reading these and let's, you know, let's talk. Let's find a time that we can talk regularly as you're reading through them. And um, that ended up being- That's amazing for this, uh, Father Joseph, I think you said, because now, as you know, as a, as a, 
parish priest yourself how hectic and crazy Sundays are after church. It's like liturgy finishes and boom, you know, everything's you're being inundated with um, meetings, questions. Yeah. Just so Absolutely. for him to like, he he recognized the importance of the situation and he told you exactly what to do so he could take care of what he needed to take care of and he made the time to like deeply connect with you and to and to hear you out on this and that's a that's a yeah. tribute to him that's amazing okay so so that, that left a huge impression on me oh, um, sure. that this man in these fancy robes who's obviously very important in this community would take the time to talk with some noob off the street who just walked yeah. in still smelling like the frat house right uh, and grabbed some books and handed them to me for free and said you know start reading oh, these wow yeah yeah um and so over the course of the next couple of months we would meet on wednesday afternoons because that's when my schedule allowed cool and um it, the proist domino when father joseph wasn't available the proist domino um would take time with me and oh and that's awesome it, it was in discussion with him and he was like you know let's be honest we see converts it happens, but usually it's because they're, you know, they're dating a pretty Greek girl. Sure. And they, they want to, Marriage is the, yeah. they want to get married in the church and so on. And he was like, you know, none of that is happening here. There's not, there's not some girl you're chasing. I can tell that, that you are being pushed. You, you are being guided by the Holy Spirit to this. So let's not stand in the way. Let's just find the next workable Sunday. Um, do you have anybody in mind who might serve as your sponsor or your godparent? And then we had the whole con godparent discussion. Cool. And I was like, hmm, I don't really know any. Oh, Dr. George Zagurnis. Oh, sure. So I texted uh, George and I was like, hey, so I think I'm going to become a Greek Orthodox Christian. And they told me I need a godparent. What are you doing? <laughs> And he was like, dude, no way. That'd be awesome. You're I'm the honored. frat bro become your like actual Nuno. Like you're that, that's he's, amazing. Yeah. He's my Nuno. Yeah. And he showed up on Greek time the day of my chrismation and almost. <laughs> I was texting him like the priest is on the solea and he's calling my well, name. Where waiting are you? on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he that's comes funny. like trotting in. He was like, I thought they were going to do it at the end of the service. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, August yeah, it was, it's right before communion, right? Because I, I do. I, he probably is thinking like um, you know memorial, baby blessing. Exactly. So, but it's right before communion, is correct? Exactly. Yeah. And I was the first to receive Holy Communion that day. Yes, uh, that's cool. my first Holy Communion. Wow. Uh, yeah. Now, what is the uh, timeline from time you from time your dad calls you to the time that you are chrismated in the church? How much time has elapsed? Late June, pr mid June, mid mid to late June, uh, when I first got that book. And then August 24th is the oh, day that's that I was awesome, man. That's, that's it, was, it was very, very short. And I brought a lot of baggage with me. Um, but that's used most of our time now just to tell you about how I became an Orthodox Christian, not even how I became a priest. Well, and we're not even, so that's, we're only, yeah, I was going to say we're half of the way there um, because now we have to figure out how you got to Hellenic College Holy Cross. Yeah. So uh, the rest of these details, I, I, I won't bog it down with all the details, but- um, That is an amazing story. So I'm glad we went through it that way though. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So just to, to recap that, when people ask, how does, how does a German and Irish kid from Ohio end up a Greek Orthodox Christian? I tell them that I was praying without knowing that I was praying mm -hmm. and God was moving me, that he was answering my, the prayers that I didn't even know that I had. Um, and basically grabbed me by the shoulders, turned me in a direction, and pushed. Um, right. And that's how I ended this up. How we, this which is how we believe he works in our lives, right? There has to be there has to be some type of not struggle, but some type of effort, some type of action on our end, whether or not we even know what it is. And he can complete that action in the way that it's supposed to come to fruition. And that's clearly the case um, with you, I believe. Absolutely. Cool. So um, now, so now you're an Orthodox Christian. Uh, you've been chrismated, and and how did you end up at uh, at Holy Cross School of Theology? Yeah, so I, I finished at Ohio State. That was leading into my senior year, um, my my actual senior, my my fifth year, my last year. Uh, and I remember trying to say like evening prayers on a Saturday night uh, while there's a party going on downstairs in the that, front house. And that, yeah. yeah, but I got to. So I also experienced OCF. Um, and I went on 
I was a member of our of our OCF at Ohio State, and I went on a real break trip that spring break. Oh, cool! Instead of joining my fraternity brothers in Daytona Beach, I went to Guatemala. Look um, at that! And so it, it stayed a part of it. It was a struggle. I will not lie about that. It was really hard. Um, and then I don't have any real leads um, after college. So a buddy of mine that I had met through the fraternity, who was from uh, Tennessee. He was like, hey, a buddy and, and I are buying a house. Uh, we need a third roommate. What are you doing? And so I moved to Tennessee and I lived in Tennessee for 365 days. Oh, wow. Um, exactly as long as my lease. Uh, and oh, it was tough. I see. I see. Yeah. So I lost close to 25 pounds in that year. Huh. Um, I was at first driving from, I lived in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And I was driving from there all the way up to Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in Nashville. Okay. It was like a 45 minute drive. Um, and That's then one day the priest wow. there, Father Gregory Honholt, was like, hey, it's a long way. And we love having you here. Don't get me wrong. But there's a, there's a little mission parish, an Antiochian mission parish right there in the town that you live in. So maybe go visit them and see, see what they're up to. Sure. There at St. Elizabeth's in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, that... I was actually formed as an Orthodox Christian where this tiny little family of a parish sort of took me in and taught me like what it means to fast. And, and yeah. the priest there, Father John Oliver, taught me, you know, how to really pray and how to work through these struggles in my life from a Christian perspective, how to accept struggle and accept, accept hardship as a refining element, as mm -hmm. something that brings us closer to who we're supposed to be um, and, and to find Christ in the suffering right. in the struggle um not to think of it as like well if christ really loved me i wouldn't be going through this right how can there be a god if they right right this whole exactly. mindset exactly. Yeah. so that was a tearful goodbye when i left tennessee and i moved back to ohio uh, i moved back in with my parents which i do not recommend uh, <laughs> zero out of ten recommend no. <laughs> that was not a good experience yeah uh, and i'm waiting tape my my childhood best friend um, bought a house. I was a roommate with him for a while. I was waiting tables at, um, at a little Lebanese restaurant in town. And I was chanting at uh, St. George okay. in Orthodox Cathedral oh, cool. there, or in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And um, I started to pick up on iconography because I remembered my formative experience. Um, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. Like yeah. this, this art form is incredible. With Which you were you were already kind of wired towards art as a hobby, correct? Or no? Or, or was this your introduction yeah, yeah. to art? Because I know that's so, a big. Okay. Most of my time at Ohio State, I was a fine art student. Um, cool. Yeah, my parents didn't think it was cool, which is why I switched. <laughs> but yeah, they're like, "Honey, this is a lot of money, um, and we put all your pictures up on the fridge." Don't. don't yeah, worry. yeah. But what are you going to do with an art degree? <laughs> right. And, right. I can confidently say now I have done as much with an art degree as I have with a journalism degree. So, um, Which are two fun degrees, though, like knowing that you went on to get the, the real degree that you would use later. Those aren't right. two bad degrees to spend your time uh, learning about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm spinning my wheels. I'm unhappy where I'm at. Um, and I, I just reach out one day to this architect in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I remembered his work because that little mission in Murfreesboro, St. Elizabeth's, uh, had posted some of the churches that this guy had designed at, on a sort of inspiration bulletin board because they were in a storefront and they wanted to build their own church. Sure. Um, and so I, I just reached out to this architect out of the blue and I didn't expect him to answer. So when he did, I didn't have anything to say. I called, his name is Andrew Gould. Um, and so I called Andrew and he was like, hello. And I was like, uh didn't plan for this i was gonna leave a voicemail uh, yeah now you have to yeah uh, yeah hey, i like your work <laughs> he was like thank you <laughs> how can i how can i help you um and so i started to explain my situation that i i wasn't necessarily finding any success in a secular field sure uh, i wanted to find a way to serve the church um and you know if i could make money if i could make a living doing that right. the ideal so I asked him, you know, how, how does one do that? You're designing churches. And he was like, well, the ship has sailed for you, my friend, because you'd need to get a degree in architecture mm, to be able to, you have to Yeah. He said, if you really want uh, 
to do that, and if you're a creative type person, the, the two ways to do it are either to learn fine finished cabinetry so that you can make the, um, the furniture for a church, all the cabinets, sure, the iconostasis, the, iconostasis, the, yeah, yeah. the thrones and pews, pews literally everything, everything. the candle stands that, yeah. And he was like that or learn to draw and paint icons. And I was like, let's do that. Who yeah. do you, who do you and he gave me a list of some stateside iconographers that would maybe consider taking on a student. And long story short, I end up talking to uh, a priest monk, uh, a, a schismatic priest monk in California, who is uh, schismatic because his abbot left the uh, the canonical churches, and he's just an obedient monk, and he swore to die in that monastery. So that's where he's at. Gotcha. His name is Father, his name is Father Patrick Doolin. Oh. Now, yeah, Father Patrick. Look at that. And Father Patrick is from Brookline, Massachusetts. Oh. Yeah. Did he begin at the other monastery? That, uh, the, yeah. The, oh, he did. Okay, look at that. Yeah. That's where he discovered Orthodoxy was at Holy Transfiguration in Brookline. Okay. Um, and so I, I go out to the monastery in Lake County, California, um, north of Sonoma, and I spend two weeks there. And I started off not thinking I knew how to... Uh, how to really draw or anything and he would just sit me uh in front of an icon in this beautiful church in santa rosa that he was painting um saint seraphim of sarov oca yeah. cathedral and he was like hey uh draw this and i'm gonna go paint on the wall and so like three hours later he'd come back down the scaffolding and he'd be like oh no try again start over this is wrong that's wrong and he'd take his big pen and he'd circle things and huh. by the end of two i could draw i like cool. it worked. Um, and uh, he, uh, he extended the invitation to come back and to come spend more time at the monastery. Sure. And I, I told him I'd have to think about it. So I went back to Ohio, went back to waiting tables, decided definitively that I did not want to go live in a schismatic monastery in Northern California forever. Um, yeah, no, yeah. Two things, I can't grow a beard and uh, I wanted to get married. Yeah, so, th th those two will do it. Those are, yeah. <laughs> it, it didn't seem like it would be my, my place in life there. Yeah. So I was kind of disheartened about that because I didn't know where this path would go. Um, and then out of the blue, a friend of mine called me one day and he was like, hey, have you considered doing this postgraduate program that I did called the John Jay Institute, uh, which is a privately funded uh, institute, sort of like a gap year program. You have to have a college degree or more to be eligible. They take between 10 and 14 fellows uh, in each semester each year. And um, it's a it's a great books course, basically. You're just reading. It's like 180 pages a night minimum. Whoa. You have to write, yeah. And then you have to write a 500 word essay by eight o'clock every morning. Whoa. Um, then six hours in class in Socratic method classes, um, basically argue about takes on things. So, anyways, I I I raise an eyebrow at this prospect because I'm not sure I want to go to graduate school, but I know that what I'm currently doing is not it's not gonna cut it. I can't wait tables for my whole life. Right. Uh, some people do. Some people love it. I wasn't one of them. Right. Uh, and so I thought, you know what? Fine. I'll, I'll apply to that. I'll, I'll at least give it a shot. And at first I got rejected. Huh. Uh, because one of my, one of my letters of recommendation never got sent in. Oh. Um, and so like a week before the spring term of 2012 at the John Jay Institute, the director, Alan Crippen, calls me. And he says, you know, we've still got a spot. One of our fellows that we had selected. Um, dropped out. We wanted you in this class, but you didn't meet the requirements because you didn't have one of these letters of recommendation. So if you can provide us any letter of recommendation from anybody in the next 24 hours, we would like to offer you a position as one of our spring fellows of this year. Cool. And the John Jay Institute is, its full name is the John Jay Institute for Faith, Society, and Law. Huh. The, the point of it is to try to form 
uh, Christian leadership in those three realms, faith, society, and law. Sure. Uh, and so that, so that we can have a better and stronger foundation when we enter the greater world um, and, and actually respond to its issues from a Christian perspective. And it was the most rigorous and difficult academic experience of my life. Wow. Uh, Two-year program? One semester. One semester? Oh, right, because it's day and night, day and night. Yeah. You're just reading, it, writing, reading, writing, it's reading. 15 writing. weeks. Wow. Uh, Probably felt like two years. Though. <laughs> oh, boy. And it aged me a couple, too. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so the last assignment is that we have to write basically a manifesto. Having done all of this work, what do you believe your vocation is? What is it that oh, God needs that. you to do in the world? Look at that. Um, and having reflected on it, I wrote a paper beginning with a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 1972 uh, Nobel laureate address um, when he received the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, and he talks about how uh, in Dostoevsky, there's the, the line, um that beauty will save the world hmm. and everybody laughs at that um but then he goes on to defend it and explain that in fact it is only beauty that can save the world because you can be lied to about truth so much that you'll believe the lie you can be lied to about what is good somebody can present to you something bad and if everybody else is saying that that is good you'll be led to believe that it's good but the only thing that can pull you out of that is when somebody presents to you something ugly and tells you it's beautiful in your heart of hearts, you know, that it's not beautiful. And so beauty, its presence, its existence is the thing that will save the world. Um, and he wrote this, you know, at the height of the cold war, he was a prisoner in a, in a Soviet gulag. And his gulag. perspective is that beauty is what will save us. And wow. so I wrote my manifesto about how I believe it to be at least part of my vocation to, uh, to expose more people to church-made beauty, where we use beauty to present a bigger story, where we use icons and architecture right. and chant, all these things to not just show you a picture, but to place you in a different experience. Right. Um, in, in the experience of the divine, in the experience of right. eternity. Which is and, what our churches are designed and built in exactly to replicate. That's, that's amazing. That's, this is really, this is a perfect manifesto for you. Yeah. So I actually lied to you earlier. It's not a 15 week program. It's a 30 week program, but the, the in-house study portion is 15 weeks. And then and you then write they, for 15 weeks? Say again? So it's the in-house study portion for 15 weeks. And then how long do you work on the manifesto? Is that the next? That's the last week. Oh, just one week. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then the, the second 15 week portion is um, they pay you to go out on an internship so that nobody has any reason to tell you no. Oh, you, okay. <laughs> you're, you're told, okay, given your manifesto, now go and do. Go find some way to start down that path. So I called Andrew Gould back okay. and I said, Hey, do you need an intern for the summer? Um, and he was like, well, I would love one, but I can't afford one. And I was like, aha, you don't ah, need they will pay me. Um, I'll be getting a stipend. If you can just help me find a place to live in Charleston, that'll be great. So I moved to Charleston for the summer, South Carolina. Um, gorgeous place. Everybody yeah. go. People, people say I've never been, um, but people say that Charleston, South Carolina is the most beautiful city in the country. I cannot uh, confirm I, or deny having never been, but would you, would you agree with that? Without a hesitation. Whoa, really? Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Old, old Charleston is gorgeous. Cool. Um, and like the Citadel, the, the private military oh, yeah. college right there in Charleston. So every night, you hear you hear the trees alive with crickets and yeah. frogs, and then you hear taps being played over oh. the mist as the students at the at the citadel are being tucked into bed, and it's just a beautiful, gorgeous. That's pretty place. cool. That it sounds like a unique city for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so while I'm, work, I'm working with Andrew on establishing uh, a couple of a couple of projects. One is the Orthodox Arts Journal. Um, which is 
the brainchild of Jonathan Peugeot and Andrew Gould okay. um, to sort of feature this kind of stuff in an online publication where look at these beautiful icons that this painter in North America is painting. Look at this architecture. This is what it should do. This is how it's supposed to look. To sort of try to raise awareness in Western hemisphere Orthodox Christianity yeah. of the deep richness of the beauty of our tradition. Highlighting um, all these great projects that do exist around the country, right. even though it's because it's hard to hear about these things. So it's cool that he, he compiled them all together, it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just like, oh, there are beautiful churches in the old world. Right. But we have the potential to do that here. Yeah. We can do beautiful things here. Um, and so halfway through that, uh, that time, I decided I wanted to go and pursue this academically. I wanted to, after this summer, I, I was ready now to go back to school. And so I applied to St. Vladimir's in Yonkers, New York. Oh, did not know that. Before Holy Cross, you applied to St. Vladimir's. Okay. I applied to both at the same time. Okay, I gotcha, gotcha. Vladimir's and Holy Cross. Um, ended up choosing Holy Cross for a variety of different reasons. Sure. Um, vainly, it was be a lot of it was because the chapel was prettier. Well, I mean, that's a huge part. Like we talked about the, the experience you have, you know, yeah. approaching the church is what, what kind of speaks to you and stuff like that. And that's the little chapel right on top of the hill. How can you, how can you see it and not like that? How can you not? Exactly. Towards that? Yeah. And cooler or even, even more awesome story here. Um, I, I wasn't sold on it. So I decided I would go and visit before making that decision. So once my 15 weeks ended in, Charleston, there was going to be a brief period of time um, when I had to go back to Ohio and figure out if I was going to go to seminary. So I decided okay. to, or no, 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 let me back up. It was before I went to Charleston. It was as the John Jay Institute's in-house semester was finishing, I drove to Holy Cross to go check it out. Okay. Because uh, I thought maybe down the line, this would be a good thing for me to check out and, and know. And when I showed up, uh, it was evening, and uh, Father Nick Belcher, uh, I had been I had been chatting with him. Um, he was like, "Hey, if you get here after such and such a time, we're all going to be in the in the chapel." And so I go, and I get lost in Brookline, I, which is not hard to do. All the this the winding streets, you can't. It's beautiful, but if have it, if it's your first time there, it's very hard to figure out where you're going. Yeah, at night with like no street oh yeah, and forget about lights it. and yeah. Anyway, so I get, to, I get to the chapel about halfway through uh, Vespers, and I walk in, and as I'm in the narthex, I hear a very familiar voice. Rewind back to Ohio State, as I'm reading about Orthodox Christianity, I read this thing about Byzantine chant, and that, like, that's the music of the Greek Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. and I fell in love, and I, I'm on YouTube. There at the, in the chapel, yeah. Yeah, Probably one of the best chanting you'll hear in the country. Yeah, absolutely. And so one one particular recording was the thing that I would go back to and meditate with and spend time. I didn't understand any Greek. I didn't understand anything about Byzantine music, but Capella Romana's I was, recording, I knew, yeah. the lament for the fall of Constantinople, um, is the thing that I would always and I still do. I still go back to that recording. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the lead singer, if you could call him that, on that recording is a man named John Michael Boyer. Um, yes, it is. I knew that name because I had stalked Capella Romana by this point. So anyways, so now fast forward a couple of years. I'm Wait, so he was at the chance now that night? <laughs> well, so you're just, your mind yeah. is being blown right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I walk into the chapel and I hear John Boyer. And I was like, which is a very recognizable voice. If you, if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. If not, I listen to a lot of chant and boyer's voice is distinct yes uh, and so i was like whoa that's amazing and then this guy on the other side starts chanting in arabic and it's equally as beautiful rasam uh, rasam I mean, yeah um and so that was my introduction to holy cross and i was Man, like what a night to walk in the chapel like, yeah sold yes <laughs> sign so, me up yeah <laughs> so if i'm going to a seminary this is going to be the one for sure uh, Anyways, that night that I visited the, the chapel afterwards, uh, I, I was like lingering out front or something. And Boyer sees a new guy and he was like, hey, new guy, 
do you want to go get burgers with us? And I was like, can, can I? <laughs> and so we went and got burgers. And one of the first people that I got to know at, at the seminary was Boyer. That's awesome. Uh, long story short, he's become one of my best friends. He chanted my wedding, um, so on and so forth. Anyways, so I finish with the externship. We've established the Orthodox Arts Journal and the Orthodox Illustration Project, which is connected to it, um, sort of an attempt to bring traditional manuscript illumination into a digital space so that people can download it and use it in modern publications. Um, something that's better than clip art and more, uh, more true to our tradition. Yeah. And uh, I decided I'm going to, I'm going to go to this seminary and I'm going to get a master's in theological studies, a two-year academic degree. And I'm going to move on to doctoral. Ah, work. So you were aiming for MTS first. Interesting. Okay. Exactly. I get to the seminary and I'm wearing like tweed blazers and ties and everything while all my classmates are wearing these goofy looking long black dresses. Yeah. Uh, and I remember I was seated at one of those cafeteria tables with a bunch of new people. Like, I don't know any of these guys. And you know how the cafeteria has like that old Wendy's awning? It does, dude. It does. The, the glass, right? like the, the, the strangely angled glass that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I'm sitting so that I can look out that window yeah. and this girl walks by Oh, and I was in trouble. I put my knife and my fork down and I waited for her to walk into the door and I turned and I just watched her walk in so that she would catch my eyes. Oh, uh, And that was Jessica Tyndall from Austin, Texas, who is now my wife. Sure uh, later that same semester, Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit, um or no maybe it was in holy week of the next semester Wait, Anyways, are you a freshman? Or what are you is this your first year freshman, at holy first Cross? year okay. first year um metropolitan nicholas of detroit uh comes and speaks to us at vespers one night and um i was sitting that's pretty alone. cool because that's not common uh, i mean they, right. the metropolitans visit from time to time but the, yeah that's pretty cool so and then he came to eat with us in the cafeteria and i'm sitting alone at a table just because i was the first among my friend group to go and sit down yeah and in walks the metropolitan and everybody stands up and yeah. i'm sitting i'm standing alone and he comes right over to me and he introduces himself and sits down and asks to know about me and i no told way. him I was and he was like he leans close and he said do you know where i am the bishop and you probably you, there's no way you knew at this point right because you you didn't know this is your first time seeing it yeah by that point i knew oh um, okay 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 I was like, yes, your eminence, you are the Metropolitan of Detroit. And he said, and whose territory is Toledo, Ohio? And I said, the Metropolitan of Detroit. And he said, then why don't I know you? Oh. Um, and that began uh, a very important uh, relationship in my life. So those are two major relationships. I met my wife. I met the Metropolitan who would ordain me. For sure. And I met my spiritual father. Um, you know, at the seminary, they have this awesome program where local clergy sign up of their own free will and accord to take young angsty uh, seminarians under their wings as their spiritual fathers at least for a time right um, and sort of the same kind of thing happened everybody had split off and found all these guys because all, all these priests come and talk to the whole freshman class at once um, and then they sort of go to different parts around the room and if you want to talk to father dimitri you go over there if you want to talk to father george you go over there <laughs> Okay. And this guy was standing all by himself and like he was between me and the door. I was trying to go towards the door and <laughs> he was there. Yeah. And and we made eye contact and he was like, "Hello." And I was like, "Hi." Uh, and Father Dimitri Tonius is yes. my spiritual father. And so in conversation with now these three very important people in my life, um the bishop who would ordain me, the woman that I would marry and who would bear my children, Mm -hmm. and my spiritual father in conversation with them towards the end of that first year it became clear that tweed jackets and ties in the halls of academia was not necessarily going to be my path right uh, and so at the end of my first year i well in the summer after my first year i changed my course to the seminarian track um master of divinity right masters of divinity mm -hmm. um which unfortunately doesn't teach you how to ride on a broomstick um 
Is that right. a Harry Potter joke? I don't it's know. a Harry Potter joke. Right, sorry, I don't, I don't know Harry Potter. Can you believe it? Anyway, yeah. No, I don't know anything about Harry Potter either, but a Masters of Divinity sounds like it comes from Hogwarts. Oh, but, God, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> like, that's not a real degree. What? Um, so, uh, yeah, so then I, I, I enter the seminary and track on that path toward priesthood, potentially. Yeah. Uh, end up, like you said in the opening bio, I was ordained to the diaconate on Palm Sunday in my hometown in Toledo, Ohio, by His Eminence Metropolitan Nicholas. And then um, shortly before graduation, it was less than a month, um, I get a phone call from His Eminence uh, saying, you know, I had hoped that the chess pieces would move and I'd have a place to put you after you graduate, but I don't. It's um, a tricky game. That, that chess game, particularly of spots, openings, um, uh, you know, different yeah. situations parishes are and it is a very it's a very tricky um complicated game of chess just like you said yeah and as though entering the priesthood is not uh daunting or daunting enough mm -hmm. to now a month before be told we don't know where we're going to put you yeah um and so i was released to the archdiocese and uh i was placed with well i was i was assigned to holy trinity in new rochelle new york that's right where Father Nicholas Ankel is the priest and has been for 20 some years. Yeah. His daughter is married to one of the previous interviewees on this program, yes. Father Chris Fratellis, and another one of my very close friends and my classmate. Right. Um, so I went and worked with my friend's dad for a couple of In years. New York City, yeah. Ended up uh, wanting to get out of the Big Apple because we, we were very far from any family and it's expensive out there, kids. It's um, tough starting a new family, you know, anywhere right. um, in parish life, let alone in one of the most expensive cities in the country. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we hung up, we, I hung a shingle out and, you know, started to look for something in a place more affordable and Ogden, Utah opened up and uh, I was asked if I wanted it. And I said, yeah, please. Yeah. And that brought me out to the mountain West. Um, we, arrived well the day that we came to visit ogden uh we were on vacation and we flew up from austin texas from my wife's hometown and that morning as we're getting ready to catch our uber to the airport and fly to a strange state and meet new people as their incoming new priest i'm presented with three positive pregnancy tests whoa that's right that the, was the, yeah. the uber is on the way <laughs> I don't have time to process it. And <laughs> my wife was like, yeah, we're gonna have a baby. Um, and so uh, that began this stage of my life. That baby was born later the next year and we decided to choose some kid we knew at the seminary to be his godfather. Um, well, now let me, let me hop in here for a second because you know what I've heard on this journey is that it was a series of decisions you made in your life right like you like you said you were trying to find your way in college and you you decided to look more into orthodoxy you decided to go to church by yourself one sunday um you know there was a series of great decisions that you made but i, I do believe one of the best decisions you ever made was uh in choosing the new no for your firstborn son jacob yeah the jury's out and we're not sure yet um, oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> no it absolutely was and just like all the other decisions that i made in my life it wasn't really like i didn't like lay out a tarot deck and right and i'd like hmm which one of these do i want to go? yeah uh, it's like the waters parted and it was clear this is this is the way that it, this should go yeah uh, and so that's how that's how we landed with christo papadimos yeah. as our firstborn's godparent um both of the god god families yeah. um from or of, of our two children are from the seminary the other um is a classmate of mine originally uh, at Holy Cross. He he graduated with an MTS. I was good friends with him, Christopher Choss, and my wife was good friends with his wife, Vasiliki Choss, and they ended up moving to Ogden, Utah. Uh, he's from Salt Lake, ended up moving to Ogden. So we live- Look at that. Months. And yeah, so- Together in Brooklyn, has... together in Ogden of all places. Yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. Absolutely. And 
that leads me to one of the one of the questions I have, and there there's just a two, uh, couple of questions I'm going to ask here um, because we are coming to the end of an uh, end of our time, and um, but I do want to round this off because this has been this has been an awesome interview. Um, one of you spoke very beautifully about your experiences at the seminary, and I just want to ask what are some of the things you enjoyed the most about the seminary? A lot of people that um, seem to enjoy tuning into these podcasts are either at the seminary right now, they're thinking about going to the seminary. What, what are some of the things you enjoyed the most about your time at the seminary? Yeah. Um, the intention, the fact that we were all there to be centered around that chapel, uh, that all of our studies, it didn't matter how deep you were in the books. When the bell rang for chapel, you closed your books and you went to chapel. Yeah. Um, to live that way in this tiny little community. Um, you know, that's the way, that's the way Constantine built his cities. Uh, when he re, when he would found a city or rebuild a city, he would put a church in the middle and yeah. everybody around it, that would be their focal point. Um, it's still the way monasteries are built. And so a lot of times I think people compare Holy Cross to a monastery because that's like the closest analog that we have where you have this life that's rooted in faith. We're all there for basically the same reason and it all rotates around the chapel. Yeah. I don't think that works because we have like married people and children running around, but it, it does remind you of that intentional lifestyle of early Christianity of, you know, everything we do is gonna focus here. Um, and so I think that when you ask that question, the first thing I say is, yeah, definitely to live a life where you're in church twice a day mm-hmm. uh, by hook or by crook, you're yeah. there. Um, and it was just a beautiful way to live. Yeah. And, um, to get to know people who get it, who know what sort of thought process brought you here. Right. Uh, right. You know, there's... someone who understands what you, what the the phase that you're at in your life, and and they without right without having to sit down and, and ask specifically, they know why you're there, and they can help you get the rest of the way, which is exactly. which is what's amazing about the school is like, it's a place where you might not know everything going, you definitely don't know everything going there, you still don't know everything leaving there, but you know where to find all the information now. You've you've met all the people that are the experts in these fields. They've they've directed you to you know the right way to explore where these these books are um and so that that's one thing that i think is um very um you know it's kind of amazing about a place that small but to have that much um you know that much of a network to resources to the right people it's amazing absolutely and to have you know liturgical scholars around where you can like at lunch you can ask some about you know uh when do you put the hat on right Uh, or, you know, or where does the baptismal rite come from? Or, right. you know, that, that your, your basic in and out daily conversation can be about churchly things. But also, here's the second point, mm-hmm. is that all these people are united in this, in this same purpose, and, and you, you're there for the same reasons, more or less. Um, you also, you find people across a broad spectrum. You know, I, I won't say that everybody there is robots and automatons and we're all the same because right. we're very clearly not. Um, but you find people that will test you and push you to grow and to mm-hmm. become more than you were. Mm-hmm. You will be given roles in that uh, yeah. chapter. Like here I am a convert kid and uh, the ecclesiarch, the person who's in charge of the chapel is a student. And he comes up to me and asks if I want to be an altar captain, if I want to help teach these guys that grew up being Greek Orthodox altar boys, if I want to be in charge of them in the altar yeah. Yeah. there. Um, and so you get these, these opportunities that uh, to live your faith and to own it and to make it yours. Right. Um, the beginning I, of the life of servant leadership, it's right there. It's at, it's at the school, definitely in many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it is a crucible. It's hard. It's a hard life to live, but it's a beautiful one. And there's no better preparation for priestly ministry than something like that, um, where you have this tender home where you can go through these struggles together and sort of get formed in those fires together so that when you are then sent out into parishes, you have that network to fall back on. You have those experiences that still come to mind when, as a parish priest, when I'm struggling, I think about 
you know, all night vigils in the chapel. Right. I think about going to Mount Athos with my classmates. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, and honestly, when I was in, when I was on Mount Athos, we were at the monastery of Xenofondos. The monks asked if we would chant at the left choir, and we, oh, cool. they, they even told us, uh, you know, if you want to mix in some English, you're welcome to. Um, so here we are in this monastery built before the founding of America. Right. Um, in the heart of everything that you've been studying for your whole life, you're, you're at, it doesn't get any more uh, legitimate than, than Mount Athos and especially a service there for sure. Yeah. And so we're there for the all night vigil for Pentecost. And I remember looking up at like, I don't know, 11 D in the morning. It was, yeah. it was middle of the night and the rest of the monks, except for the right choir, the rest of the monks are all on their stasidia, yeah. their heads down, like nodding in and out. Yeah. Good. Pretty sure. Some of them were asleep. Sure. Um, and that's when it hit me that these monks have in, entrusted the carriage of this service to me. Yeah. That's, that was the moment that I was no longer borrowing somebody else's church. I was no longer right. borrowing faith. That's when I was like, oh, this is my faith too. Yeah. This is my, um, so you didn't ask about that, but um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm glad you told us anyway, because that's uh, but but that is part of your experience at the seminary. If it was if it, just like just like me, um, if we'd never gone to the Holy Cross School of Theology, probably never would have gone to Mount Athos. I definitely wouldn't have ever made it to the Holy Lands, to Constantinople, all these amazing places. And that's all thanks yeah. to this uh, wonderful program, the uh, senior trip or pilgrimage of St. Helen um, that they offer to the seniors. So that's um, I am glad that you brought that up because that is that is almost as formative as the entire four years itself. But we could we could spend another hour and a half on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then so to, to bring us home and, um, you know, and this can be this is I don't know if this question is easily answerable, but what Father Patrick to you, what are the greatest joys of the priesthood? Um, Having, having been a priest in several different roles um, in several different cities, um, but I feel like you are, you are one who's kept his um, favorite focuses in line. Um, you know, you've remained true to yourself in, in all your different roles. So what are the greatest joys for you uh, as a Greek Orthodox priest? It's really hard to pin that down. It, it uh, is, it is. Or some of, of the, some of the greatest joys, not yet, yeah, not to accept yeah. those. I think what, what comes right to mind is a uh, 40 day churching. Ah, uh, that's now that's cool. Go on about that. To, so to bring a new child into the church for the first time as somebody who used to borrow this faith, you know, as somebody uh -huh. who discovered it on the internet one night and walked into a church by himself with great hesitance to welcome a mother and her child at the narthex and then to have that woman hand me her child yeah and i walk that baby in to the church into the the assembled body into the kingdom of heaven and i get to carry them in like every time it's super emotional yeah um, man. i mean baptisms the mysteries the 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 sacraments are always beautiful um, but they're more, from a parish priest perspective, they're more work. It's, it's, it's what we there's do. There's a lot more, there's logistics with them. There's um, court, there's planning, there's schedules, there's photographers running around. There's, there's a lot more formality. There's nothing more pure, I feel like, than the 40-day blessing. for, for the, Yeah. So that one, I think, is a huge one for me. Um, every time somebody calls and says, you know, uh, can we schedule this, uh, I'm I'll, I'll expose myself here. So at the Greek Orthodox Church of Greater Salt Lake, uh, we have two churches. We're one of two, two parishes in the country that are set up this way, us and Astoria, uh, where we have two churches uh -huh. in, one, in one parish, governed by one parish council, one ladies philoptikos, all of those things. Um, so we have Holy Trinity Cathedral downtown and Prophet Elias Church in Holiday, Utah, about 20 minutes apart. And um, when they call and they and I take the call, I will usually try to schedule it at whichever church i'm going to be at that day um so that i can hog all the fun that's awesome i really that is that's one of the things that that sustains me that that's yeah. very important to to hang on to those things and to to you know reflect on why those things are so um you know 
joyful to you and that's a, so that, that's a good that's a good answer i wasn't I, I wasn't expecting that one but that now that you said it it is like a, probably one of the coolest things that um a priest yeah. gets to do well and yeah not to diminish all the other things like last no, night of I, course we could get into it yeah for yeah. sure yeah yeah but that, that's a, i like that answer but i'm sure in this series of interviews you're gonna have all those answers too exactly so. exactly right. so that's a good one well, Father Patrick, I uh, can't thank you enough for joining us tonight on Path to the Priesthood. I, I'm sure that many people um, at many different phases of their spiritual journeys, whether they be people thinking about converting to the faith, um, you know, people born and raised as Orthodox Christians thinking about maybe going to the seminary, to the school, or to pursuing some type of ministry in the church. I think a lot of people have found inspiration, um, something they can connect with. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people will benefit from hearing about your story. And so we thank you for sharing it. Thank you, Christo. Thank God for giving me the story, for, for taking me by the shoulders and pushing me in the right direction and teaching me early on to trust him and to follow him. So very nice. And we thank everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed and we look forward to seeing you next time on Path to the Priesthood. Thank you.